One of the things that I've always wondered about is the phrase, who cares, that you hear it so often. The shrug of indifference is a very sad shrug. And apathy, apathy and ignorance, I think, are our worst enemies. A maioria das pessoas passa a vida apenas tentando sobreviver. E o resto delas se perde em distrações, bombardeadas por informações desconectadas de sentido. E muitas vezes acreditamos que o mundo é assim mesmo. Os problemas são grandes demais, impossíveis de se resolver. Será que ainda somos capazes de nos importar? We are not here to enjoy our life. Somebody who created the world and we are just a kind of guest here. We are not guests here. We are creators. We create our own life. We create our own world. So before we create our own world, we must imagine what kind of world we want to create. And then start doing that. to create. You know, consciousness precedes matter. So first we have to imagine it. First we have to know it. And then we have to go beyond what we even think is possible. It's like when Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon, everyone said, hmm, we're going to go to the moon. But we went to the moon. thinking that, you know, wow, the world's in a tough time right now. Oil, rising food prices, rising oil prices, um, what, you know, war and conflict all around the world. Um, you know, maybe a loss of faith in leadership and, and um, you know, perhaps the integrity of leadership. And, 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 and I think there's a, lot, there's a lot there, but let's also look at some of the good things that are happening. Now more than ever, people are really thinking about clean energy. People are really thinking about how they can connect with people all around the world via the internet. And through, I think, a growing consciousness, I think people fundamentally are, want to see a better world. And we've learned that conflict and, and, and hanging on to the past and, and, you know, a lot of the comforts that we really value aren't that important and, and, and can be let go of. So I would say it's, it's a whole, basically, issue of uh, lifestyle, how you live on this planet. Uh, what kind of uh, responsibility you impose on yourself. So once you know that, then you become conscious that uh, if I take this, if I enjoy my life this way, I'm harming somebody else's life. And the basic principle should be my life should not harm anybody's life. 
Talvez seja preciso ser um tipo especial de pessoa para provocar uma grande mudança que se espalha por toda a sociedade e afeta milhões de vidas. Mas todos nós podemos trazer alguma mudança positiva para algum canto do planeta. Todo mundo pode mudar o mundo. Quando o cidadão comum disse chega, nesse planeta eu não vivo, e chega não é um chega e eu fico acomodado. Chega, eu vou fundar. Chega, eu vou fazer. Não importa se ele faz para ajudar quatro pessoas ou para ajudar mil. O importa é o sentimento que está por trás. Quando eu comecei o trabalho que eu fiz, as pessoas realmente pensaram que eu era louca. E eu tinha tantas pessoas que disseram que isso nunca vai funcionar. Por que não conseguir um trabalho? E eu tinha bons amigos que me levaram para jantar e dizer, eu só amo ver você gastando todo o seu talento nesse sonho ridículo. E, sabe, eu posso conseguir um trabalho para você. Todo mundo estava tentando me ajudar, porque eles pensaram que isso é tão estranho, mas você perdeu o seu caminho. E eu, às vezes, não podia explicar, porque eu não tinha um contexto para entender. E then one day I remember I met Bill Drayton and he said, "Oh, you're not crazy. You're a social entrepreneur." Eu comecei ator e daí eu virei palhaço e daí eu virei é, gestor de ONG, é, produtor. When I check into a hotel, I like to write a uh, writer. <laughs> Because when I grow up, I want to be a writer. Well, um, I write, uh, let's see, what do I write? What is a social entrepreneur? <laughs> <laughs> uh, mostly I write researcher, uh, as, because that is uh, what I officially am in Tanzania. Como no me sentía identificado con ninguna de ellas, ponía arquitecto, ingeniero, Spider-Man, Superman, eh, jardinero, cualquier cosa. Cuando faço check in no hotel, yo escribo con mucho orgullo empreendedor social. No escribía, no. The concept of social entrepreneur is not widely known. Uh, maybe I should promote it better. Maybe I should, uh, indeed, and start explaining what it is. Y luego de que me identificaron como emprendedora social, dije, por fin. Y ahí siempre escribo en la cuestión de avión, en profesión, emprendedor social. When people suddenly understand that they belong to this profession, it is so liberating. My godmother, who loves me dearly, for years struggled with this. She would say to her friends, my godson Bill is sort of a lawyer, but not quite, mumble, mumble. And now she gets to say social entrepreneur, and people say, oh, yes, that's very good. Uh, this is very useful. Qualquer pessoa é, 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 pode ser um empreendedor social, não é nenhuma bênção divina, não, não, você não toma comprimido para virar empreendedor social, você simplesmente se conscientiza do seu poder de transformação. Este conceito de que todo mundo pode cambiar o mundo é um conceito muito genuíno, porque de verdade, desde qualquer sector, desde cualquier porción de planeta, es posible que surjan iniciativas que pueden cambiar el rumbo del planeta. El reconocimiento de que no hace falta ser un PHD, de que el conocimiento de un indígena, de que el conocimiento de una mujer de una comunidad tradicional es tan importante o tan fundamental para el mundo como aquel que es producido por un gran científico de un gran laboratorio, creo que es un estado de conciencia que nos hacía falta. I think a social entrepreneur is someone who sees hope sometimes when other people see no hope, sees possibilities where there are no possibilities, and is able to look at the spaces in between. They're visionary in many ways, they have imagination, they have hope, but infinitely practical practical and detailed oriented in a very strange, strange way. What I do think is a new trend is that more and more of us are standing up and embracing it as our role in society, that we are really becoming increasingly interconnected and realizing that each of us has a responsibility. And if we are to really create a better world for all of us, 
then we have to take part. Os conceitos são novos e ainda se misturam. Afinal, qual é o nome que se dá para um rico empresário que decide doar toda a sua fortuna para desenvolver o setor social? Ou para um ativista que, de tanto protestar, inicia um movimento que acaba mudando tudo ao seu redor? Afinal, quem é o empreendedor social? It is not the ability to manage. It is not the ability to get things done. It is not even leadership. There are millions of people who have those qualities. What defines the entrepreneur is they have seen where society has to go. They care about it deeply and they are going to make that happen and they are betting their lives that they're going to do it. They'll spend as long as is necessary. All social entrepreneurs, if you ask them at some point in their life, at least all that I met until now, at some point in their lives, they got confronted with injustice, with poverty, uh, name it, with an imbalance in society. Because of this contrast experience, people actually do start being engaged for a specific goal. When I was only five years old, I had a profound experience that has forever affected me, I think is the reason why I'm here today, um, which was I was in the market. And I remember uh, I was with my mother, and it was in the monsoon season. So it was very muddy and wet. And I had dropped a, a, a one rupee coin, which is worth just pennies, just very small amount of money. And my mom said, oh, just let that go. And a woman who was maybe in her 60s, uh, a beggar, walked up and s sifted through the gutter just to pick up that one, pace, uh, one uh, rupee coin. And I think for a five-year-old to see someone who is, is older than you, someone that you would typically respect and revere, actually um, kind of the, the, the lack of dignity that poverty can create um, or just a, that, that survival instinct, that really stuck with me. Se apontar um momento, assim, um momento que você disse, bom, daqui, agora não tem mais jeito, agora minha vida vai ser essa, foi aquele oito meses, dez meses que eu morei na rampa do Janguru Sul, em Fortaleza, no meio dos catadores de lixo, convivendo com os urubus, com os bichos, com o lixo, com a lama, com a alimentação, que tudo ali é um contexto só, onde você tem essa... Eu olhei o fundo do poço da miséria humana. E ali eu disse, não tem mais jeito, né? Daqui para frente, a minha vida inteira vai ser em defesa dos pobres, enfrentando esse flagelo da humanidade que é a pobreza e a miséria. I was teaching in one of the universities in Bangladesh in the mid 70s and I saw the economic situation going bad and worse and people are suffering. So I wanted to see if uh, as a person I can do something. So what I wanted to do is to go out and be with the people, see if they, as, a, as a human being, if I could be of uh, any use to anybody. Then I saw how loan sharks are taking advantage of the poor people and uh, giving a small amount of loan, in the process taking the full control of their life and uh, using them as uh, slave labor. So I thought uh, I can do something about it. So I made a list of people to understand what they need, and uh, the total money they borrowed was $27. Then I thought came that if you can make so many people so happy with such a small amount of money, why don't I do more of it? So I wanted to do more of it. I went to the bank to persuade them to lend money to the poor people in the village so that they don't have to go to the loan sharks. Bank said, no, it cannot be done. So I started a big controversy with the banks, telling them that this is not right, they should lend money, but they didn't listen. Ultimately, I offered myself as a guarantor. I said, I'll sign all your papers, I take the risk, and you give the money. And finally, they accepted that. That's how it all began. And I wanted to make sure people do pay back, and came up with simple rules, made them easy for the, so that they can pay back the money. And they did, so I was very happy. 
And then I started expanding it and expanding it, having the same result, people are always paying back. And that now became known as microcredit. Yunus criou o Banco Gramin, que foi o primeiro do mundo especializado em microcrédito. Com uma ideia tão simples como emprestar dinheiro aos mais pobres, este homem inspirou várias instituições ao redor do mundo. I thought I was solving a problem in the village. It's a local problem. But later on, as I went on, I saw it's not a local problem, it's a national problem. And then I saw it's not a national problem, it's a global problem. It's a problem is everywhere. You can't think of a major problem the world has that doesn't need the solution to at least be partially global. You can't solve the environment problem in one country. We cannot build a safe financial system in one country or even the rich countries alone. It won't work. And we're being asked to think now, how do you solve global problems together as community? So how, how do you start thinking about that if you've never had the experience of feeling a part of a global community? In the history of humanity, which has its good miles and miles of years, I think it's the first time that we as a species nos sentimos globalmente ameaçados. Nós não temos mais tempo. Eu acho que o consumo já está exagerado, a produção de lixo, desperdício está exagerado, o aquecimento global é fato. E existe uma conta muito simples e que não fecha. A Terra, se a gente não mudar, ela vai limpar o ser humano como a dona de casa limpa a sua casa. Com água quente, o jato de vapor, com o ventinho da vassoura. Hoje o planeta Terra é um carro em alta velocidade rumo ao abismo. Nós não vivemos no mundo sustentável. Nós precisamos desacelerar e mudar completamente a direção. Que se todos os humanos, todas as comunidades de seres humanos, não reaprendem a ética do cuidado, evidentemente nós inminentemente estaríamos camino hacia la autodestrucción. Oscar Rivas é especialista no tema da água. Ele acredita que podemos recuperar áreas totalmente degradadas, transformando-as em paraísos. É o que sua organização vem fazendo em várias terras do Paraguai. Eu cheguei lá uma vez numa comunidade, aí uma comunidade de pescadores no meio do Rio Amazonas. Aí eu cheguei na comunidade, eu falei, aí eles perguntam, mas o que que o senhor veio aqui, bem, doutor? Eu falei, não, a gente veio aqui o projeto, a gente veio aqui, não foi para dar o peixe para vocês, foi para ensinar vocês a pescar. Aquela comunidade olhou para mim, eles eram todos pescadores, falou assim, para um paulista médico, veio aqui ensinar a gente a pescar. A gente pensou que o senhor vinha atender a gente, doutor. Então, a partir de eu nunca mais usei essa, essa frase, sabe? Eu era o único médico para 800 comunidades rurais. E aí eu vi uma situação que eu não conhecia, quer dizer, eram, uma, eram comunidades que, que nunca tinham visto médico. E a mortalidade altíssima, diarreia, 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 anemia, anemia, verme, verme. E aí eu chegava na comunidade e tinha 150 pessoas para atender em um dia, dois dias. Eu comecei a separar as pessoas por tipo de doença. Quem está com diarreia para cá? Quem está com gripe para lá? E começava a dar aula explicando a parte educativa, que se eu fosse tentar explicar um a um os cuidados de higiene, lave a mão, trate a água, use chinelo, eu não atendia ninguém. E aí comecei a usar métodos assim mais divertidos. 
Na verdade, o circo e o Saúde e Alegria, ele foi nascendo das maneiras mais eficientes e simples de educar as pessoas. Cada pequeno problema na comunidade é resultado de todos os fatores que envolvem aquela comunidade, desde os culturais, sociais, econômicos, histórico, organização social. Então, para você desenvolver uma comunidade, você precisa é, mexer com tudo. A organização criou um barco hospital que consegue chegar nas regiões mais remotas da floresta. O barco leva uma equipe capaz não só de trabalhar na área da saúde, mas também na organização da comunidade, economia da floresta, educação, cultura e comunicação. A primeira estratégia foi Estar junto com a comunidade. Estar junto com a comunidade não é o que muita gente acha, que chega lá um médico e fala, oh, eu não sei nada, eu vim aqui aprender com vocês. Ou então outro que chega lá e fala, olha, vocês têm que fazer isso, têm que fazer aquilo, têm que fazer aquilo. São duas coisas erradas. Nós dois temos coisas a colaborar, temos contrapartidas e obrigações mútuas a serem realizadas. Então, é uma realidade de parceria. Criar a consciência de que todos podemos ser transformadores. É isso que algumas organizações sociais estão conseguindo fazer. Envolver a comunidade em todos os trabalhos, de modo que a população tome as rédeas do poder e possa guiar o seu próprio desenvolvimento. Se você quiser fazer alguma coisa para a inclusão social, pela pobreza, a primeira coisa é considerar os pobres como cidadãos capazes e dar a eles instrumentos para que eles se desenvolvam, respeitando eles como irmãos, como parceiros de um projeto conjunto. Eu, quando eu vi as comunidades da Amazônia, foi a coisa mais linda do mundo, porque as comunidades são lindas, né? Elas têm uma saúde mental, uma saúde espiritual, uma saúde cultural. Elas têm um meio ambiente interno e externo enorme, muito grande. Um dia o prefeito perguntou, como é o nome do teu projeto, que não tem nome? Eu falei, é, ah, saúde e alegria. Sei lá de onde que veio, mas pronto, saúde e alegria. Mas agora eu já sei por que que chama. Tem uma mulher na comunidade que ela falou, um jornalista perguntou, por que chama saúde e alegria? Ela falou, porque saúde e alegria do corpo, alegria e saúde da alma. Mas eu vim descobrir isso depois. Quem é o governo? É um grupo que fica quatro, oito anos. Né? Nós, empreendedores, estamos lá no Saúde e Alegria. Eu estou há 20 anos lá em Santarém. Já passou vereador de montão, já passou prefeito de montão. Quem está que lá todo dia? São os empreendedores que estão anos e anos, todo dia, aprendendo. Né? Quem que está lá? São as empresas que estão gerando emprego, estão fazendo aquele trabalho. Os governos passam, os governos são, são frutos de pressões ou da sociedade ou do capital, ou do, do, da economia. Nós, ONGs, nós, terceiro setor, temos soluções na mão de baixo custo e alto impacto. As empresas têm capacidade de patrocinar e fortalecer isso. Então, essa união tem que ser feita com visão estratégica, de escala. E isto tudo forçar ou ser absorvido, influenciar ou alterar o governo a adotar como política pública. Eu acho que esse é o caminho. The growth of the citizen sector is a uh, new hope for society, for humanity, for the world. But only if it doesn't isolate it itself. So the critical piece of the growth of change makers and of a citizen sector is its consequent engagement with the other sectors of society. Change making will not work in isolation from government and it will not work in isolation from the corporate world. And so uh, there is hope in the world if we create a generation 
of change makers who see the good everywhere in society, who tap into that, who marshal that, who mobilize that as a force for change, regardless of where it exists. People need to begin to think out of the box. The challenges of today is quite different from what it used to be yesterday. Neither will it not be the same as what it's going to be tomorrow. Ability to think out of the box. Ability to get the people involved. See, you cannot come and decide for me what you think are my problems and what you think should be the solution. It's like giving billions of dollars to a government official who has not stepped out of his office for one year and you ask him to go and develop a slum. He does not even know the definition of a slum. He has not even lived there. He has not even belonged there. He doesn't even know what people that live in the slum, what they go through. So how is he going to succeed? You can't know me if you really don't know me. And you can't help me if you really don't know my problems. And that is why I woke up and I said, yes, I'm going to provide toilet for people who will not have toilet to use. We have set up a franchising model whereby the widows, the street gang leaders that manage or maintain our toilet, they take 60% of money generated from maintaining this toilet, and we take 40%. People are happy about it. Once the happiness is shifted to one side, then it becomes exploitation. And I said, well, if I have to do this, I have to be serious. And that's why I said, shit business, it's serious business. Of course, it has to be serious. Bringing the spirit of Richard Branson, the man who loves to make money in one hand, and bring the spirit of Mother Teresa, the woman who wants to give back to the society, bring the two of them together, then you have a social entrepreneur. Business took off. That was the first everyone in change maker world. Social arena has caught up pretty much. And now they're coming together. Most people don't see it. And it's still uncomfortable because of the history. You know, social people wear one type of clothing and one language, and the business people another. The business entrepreneur, they create value, but a lot of times it's, it's purely economic value or it's a profit. Um, and I think a social entrepreneur, they're really focused on social value, but they still use a lot of the, a lot of the things that make the business world so great. So, you know, speed, measurement, agility, building great teams, um, getting, getting people to get excited about something, much like the major companies like Coca-Cola have gotten you got everyone excited about drinking Coca-Cola. I think social entrepreneurs want to get people excited about something else. O tênis e o frescobol, mesmo jogo. Só que no tênis, eu jogo para tu errar. A tua dor é o meu prazer. No frescobol é o contrário. Eu só posso acertar se tu acertar. Então eu levanto a bola para ti de melhor forma possível para tu acertar e devolver a bola para mim. Ou seja, o teu prazer é o meu prazer. Eu só posso acertar quando tu acerta. Eu só vou ganhar quando tu ganha. Isso que é a lógica do mundo que nós estamos querendo construir. Os nossos problemas são heranças de um mundo compartimentado, setorizado. Eu não entendo hoje, justamente para poder dar conta dos erros feitos, as empresas estão falando de responsabilidade social corporativa. Eu não consigo imaginar por que, que existe uma área de responsabilidade social, ao invés de uma empresa nascer socialmente responsável. O que, que uma empresa pode aprender com uma ONG? O que, que uma ONG pode aprender com uma empresa? E nesse processo, será que é possível a gente buscar uma convergência e justamente criar um novo modelo uh, de gestão, um novo modelo de empresa que nasce socialmente responsável e que só é bem sucedida porque todo o seu entorno é bem sucedido também? <risos> Hoje, os governos nos seus PIBs, ninguém privilegia a alegria, ninguém privilegia a força voluntária de um povo. E o grande desafio da gente hoje, como empreendedores, à medida que as nossas organizações crescem, é começar a influenciar esses indicadores. 
e as pessoas já estão estudando a felicidade interna bruta que existe no Butão, enquanto que o PIB é reducionista. Quando uno vê os indicadores de desenvolvimento de um país, o principal indicador de, de como um cidadão contribui ao bem-estar é através de la, le dan la PEA, a população econômicamente ativa. A população econômicamente ativa reconhece a, 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 a população entre 15 a 64 anos de idade. Mas eu não conozco de um indicador que venga a alguém e le diga a uma niña ou um niño de 4, 8 ou 12 anos de idade sea de las zonas urbanas, rurales, pobres, ricos, no importa, que con eso que están haciendo, están hoy en día contribuyendo al bienestar de su país. Entonces, les hemos propuesto crear un, trabajar para crear un nuevo indicador que se llame la población ambientalmente activa. ¿Y quiénes son? Son todos. Pero se hace énfasis en la población menor de 18 años y en la mayor de 60 años. Sí, malos pensamientos en este momento. Ahí está. Con la crisis ambiental que vivimos, nos preguntamos por qué está sucediendo esto, ¿no? ¿Por qué si nos dicen que nuestras costumbres nos están matando, a la sociedad nos están diciendo sus hábitos de consumo están llevando al planeta a ponerse en un estado de peligro para sostener la vida humana? ¿Qué nos está pasando internamente, no? Y nos dimos cuenta que la causa es la incoherencia, la falta de coherencia. Coherente es tener la capacidad de pensar, de sentir, de decir y de hacer las cosas de manera alineada y en el tiempo. ¿Por qué a los adultos se nos es tan difícil ser coherente? Estamos pensando, sintiendo una cosa, diciendo otra. Entonces hay que remontarnos a nuestra infancia para ver por qué. Cuando yo era niño, sonaba el teléfono. ¡Tring! Ya sabía cerrar acá. Mamá, te llama el señor Rodríguez. Dile que no estoy. En la escuela. El profesor ha hablado de medio ambiente, no sé qué, no sé cuánto, y va y de repente se va afuera a fumar su cigarro normal, pero la colida la tira. O ha hablado de reciclaje, ha tomado su Coca-Cola y la tira ahí con la comida orgánica. Y en la parte de medios de comunicación, ¿para qué hablar? O sea, uno prende el televisor y la noticia más morbosa, la más cruel, la más violenta, es en la que más nos llama la atención. Entonces, cuando no hay coherencia en la sociedad, se alimenta la indiferencia, la mentira y la violencia. Entonces, tenemos que crear espacios para que las niñas y niños puedan desarrollar esa coherencia. Lo que buscamos es que, aunque sea en una maceta a nivel individual o un metro cuadrado de tierra a nivel colectivo, en ese pequeño espacio el, la niña y el niño puedan pensar sentir, decir y hacer las cosas de manera alineada y en tiempo. Sí, ¿eh? Porque nosotros sembramos ¿Sí, eh? Eh, las hortalizas y también sembramos la, las rosas, las flores de aquella parte que es para la naturaleza. ¿Sí, eh? Y finalmente, las niñas y niños van a entender que una autoestima saludable no tiene nada que ver con tu rostro, tus posesiones materiales ni tu apellido, sino tiene que ver con tu capacidad de crear bienestar para otros seres vivos. En total, en Perú, al momento hay más o menos 200 hectáreas que han sido entregadas a más de 5.000 niñas y niños. Y está pronto a multiplicarse. Esperanza es pensar y hacer y lograr que el 1% del territorio sea manejado con la población menor de 18, que representa en algunos países el 40% más. Y para los escépticos, no se preocupen. El 99% restante del planeta aún lo tendremos para hacer de él lo que venimos haciendo. Los obstáculos ellos iban surgiendo, era casi que una maratona de aquellas que você va pulando los, los cavaletes. Você pula, acho que conseguiu vencer, mas cuando você olha, tem otro y tem otro. Y entre tantos obstáculos, ainda teve o obstáculo de tentar continuar vivo, porque foram muitas as ameaças, os atentados, eu recebi arma na cara, 
Recebi... Minha casa foi atingida por tiros. Denner foi ameaçado porque o tráfico de animais é o terceiro maior do mundo. Perde apenas para o tráfico de drogas e de armas. E movimenta bilhões de dólares todos os anos. Apenas 10% dos animais roubados chegam vivos ao seu destino final. É importante que a gente quebre a espinha dorsal do tráfico exatamente onde ele é mais sensível, que é no consumidor, para que o traficante ele não tenha a quem vender. Na África, um homem transformou ratos em heróis que salvam vidas. Bart Wiggins é um monge budista belga que treina ratos na Tanzânia para detectar minas terrestres e tuberculose. People just didn't believe me. They didn't. They just laughed at me. Uh, this crazy idea. But as we moved forward and provided scientific evidence, tested and accredited, uh, people took us more and more serious. Os ratos conseguem detectar a tuberculose em amostras de saliva humana e são mais rápidos e eficientes que os laboratórios convencionais. São também treinados para detectar minas terrestres, liberando enormes áreas de terra antes inutilizadas pelas guerras. So what we actually do is empowering local communities uh, to solve humanitarian detection problems by themselves, independent from uh, foreign aid. Well, it's, it sounds almost too simple, but I would say that our biggest problem has been lack of belief, lack of imagination, lack of hope. People have not believed that it's possible, and if people don't believe it's possible, it really isn't. It's, it's like that with everything. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can, either way, you're right. What is the force that has the greatest power in the world? And it's pretty obvious, it's a big pattern change idea, but only if it's in the hands of a really good entrepreneur. It's that combination that moves the world. Once we had that insight, then the next question is, how do you intervene? So what's the most leveraged way of intervening that would increase the number of these powerful combinations of ideas and entrepreneurs in the social arena. That was exactly that question that led to Ashoka. Bill Drayton fundou a Ashoka, a primeira organização do mundo a identificar e apoiar empreendedores sociais. So when you think about the life cycle of an entrepreneur, there's a childhood, there's an apprenticeship, which typically takes quite a long time because you can't know what the next big step for a field is until you really know the field. And then you reach this really magical moment when you know you have an idea, and our skill is being able to spot the idea of the person at that moment in history when they're ready to really change the world and then to know how to really help them succeed. Bill foi o grande responsável pela disseminação do termo empreendedor social. Sua organização apoia milhares de líderes sociais em mais de 60 países. You cannot describe half of the world's operations by what it is not. This is craziness. It's based on the history of Americans seeing something new they didn't understand and saying, why aren't these people businesses, hence nonprofit? And the Europeans said, well, what's this? Why isn't it a government? And hence, non-government or NGO. And both of those phrases are very destructive. 
we are not not something. We are citizens causing major change, of which the most important change is the multiplication of change makers or citizens. There's a problem here. I'm going to organize a service. Or there's an opportunity here. I'm going to cause a change. They have become a change maker, maybe an entrepreneur, but certainly a citizen. If citizenship means anything, it's caring and organizing and doing something for the people around you. Existe um ciclo vicioso é, na saúde pública, diria no mundo, na saúde pública que, do que diz respeito às pessoas que vivem abaixo da linha da pobreza. É como cavar um buraco na areia. É um trabalho que não tem fim e que você não vê o resultado, porque a cura não se consolida. Quando eu comecei a pensar, eu não, eu não pensei numa instituição, quer dizer, a ideia não veio pronta de como é que seria é, a como é que seria o combate à miséria. Como médica no hospital, eu percebia que é, as mães sofriam muito com as doenças dos filhos. E mais do que com as doenças dos filhos, elas sofriam no momento da alta. Porque elas não tinham medo da doença, elas tinham medo das condições que elas teriam que lidar com a doença pós-alta. Elas teriam que lidar com a leucemia numa casa que chove dentro. Elas não teriam dinheiro para o transporte para chegar de volta ao hospital para fazer quimioterapia. E eu convivia com mães que diziam assim, doutora Vera, toma meu filho, a senhora cria. Porque eu não tenho dinheiro para continuar a criar. A senhora cria. E isso, me dizia assim, isso era insustentável. Eu fazia, naquela época, um eletrocardiograma em mim mesmo por semana. Quer dizer, vou infartar, vou infartar, eu vou morrer. Eu comecei a vender. Eu me lembro, as meninas trancavam os armários porque elas começaram a perceber que as roupas delas iam ser leiloadas e vendidas. E objetos da minha casa também eu comecei a vender. Então, meu marido viajava muito nessa época. E ele chegava em casa, cadê aquele relógio de parede? Eu falei, virou quimioterápico. E amigos íntimos que eu ligava, eles começaram a desaparecer, porque eles entendiam que eu não queria o cinema, que eu não queria passear, que eu queria dinheiro. Até entender que era impossível. É continuar daquela maneira, pedindo dinheiro para para apagar um incêndio, outro incêndio, o outro incêndio. E, e nesse momento, eu escrevi um projeto. E esse projeto, eu mostrei para uma ciência social, se vera, você enlouqueceu. Isso é um projeto de governo, você quer melhorar a moradia, você quer é, colocar as crianças na escola, promover o autossustento das famílias, da cidadania e da saúde. Isso é o um governo. Eu falei, é, eu estou um pouco cansada de governos. Esse vai ser o governo da sociedade civil. Certamente, mundo afora tem governos corretos, mas sem uma sociedade civil pulsante, esse mundo não tem saída. Boa tarde. Nós aprendemos a metodologia ouvindo quem servíamos, que nada mais é de que você ajudar a família a pensar na sua própria vida e durante dois anos se organizar nas cinco áreas, saúde, educação, moradia, cidadania e autossustento. Se você ajuda essa família nessas cinco áreas de uma forma integrada, você muda o patamar, muda a condição de vida dessa família e faz com que ela tenha as condições mínimas de sobrevivência. Quando eu tenho que dizer rapidamente o que é a organização, qual é o know-how da gente, eu digo, é transformar miserável em pobre. Quando a gente pensa em mudar o mundo, a gente sempre pensa em grandes milagres, em grandes somas de recursos, em novas tecnologias. Nós não precisamos disso. Com o que se já sabe, através de tecnologias sociais, de empreendedores sociais, de empreendedores de negócios, com o que já está à disposição e que com o poder da internet, esse mundo se transforma em pouco tempo. I define ideas like a parachute. A parachute is a wonderful equipment, only when it is used for what it's meant for.
If you wrap a parachute around yourself, it becomes a useless object. But if you go to the high altitude there and you now jump, you release your parachute. What happens? It comes out open. You see the beauty of the parachute and it will give you a soft landing. And that is the same way I see ideas. Ideas are things you should be able to throw open. The more you keep your idea to yourself, the more, the more useless it becomes. Your idea will end up where most ideas have ended up, in the cemetery. Eu me lembro que quando eu estava pensando o futuro do Doutores, eu já pensava nele como uma escola, como um lugar de formação, de ensino. E aí um consultor, com todo o seu conhecimento ancorado no passado, virou para mim e falou, mas você vai ensinar para a sua concorrência aquilo que você tem de mais precioso e vocês depois vão concorrer pelas mesmas verbas? E eu falei, puxa aí, tem uma pergunta interessante. Qual é a minha concorrência? A minha concorrência é com um cara que está no interior do Ceará tentando fazer esse trabalho para as crianças naquela região, ou a minha concorrência é com a falta dele bem treinado e bem preparado e fazendo um trabalho cada vez melhor. Então eu vi que a minha concorrência não era com quem está querendo fazer igual, mas com a ignorância, com a falta do saber e da oportunidade do acesso. Quando Wellington Nogueira conheceu o trabalho dos palhaços em hospitais, teve uma compreensão profunda sobre o papel social da arte. Abre a porta e aí, calmamente, você passa. Por acreditar na força da alegria como transformadora da realidade, ele criou uma organização que foi, em grande parte, responsável pela humanização hospitalar no Brasil. Então ficou claro que eu não queria ser o dono do palhaço no hospital, mas o molden para fazer um download de bons palhaços no século XXI em proximidade com as pessoas. So if you want to move to heavy duty change making, you have to let go of any ownership of the idea because the point of the change making is to embed your ideas in structure, in systems, in in the water supply. Lo importante justamente es que nosotros podamos descontaminar el mundo de estos procesos absolutamente antinaturales de privatización de las ideas, del, de, del, del pensamiento, de las soluciones. O sea, nosotros debemos sentirnos parte de un movimiento que genera ideas. Y qué mejor tributo a esas grandes ideas que simplemente se instalen en el mundo. En la ciencia, we used to study very linear systems where if you made a small change to the system, it would just change incrementally. Um, but now people realize that in complex systems, out of a very small change, entirely new behavior can emerge. So I think people have the sense that very small actions can add up much more quickly than, than we previously thought, um, and that individuals or small groups of individuals can really tip a system. If we can get 20 or 30 percent of this generation of young people to be change makers before 21, we'll flip the system that to do that, parents have to be worried about whether or not their 15-year-old is practicing change-making. They know to be worried if, the, if, if that child is failing at math, they'll do something. Would they even notice if she or he was not practicing change-making? I see um, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, you know, popping up all over the place. And I see people telling stories of the entrepreneurs, which basically then creates a virtuous cycle of more 
people who are learning about social entrepreneurs, they actually start becoming social entrepreneurs, which actually creates more social entrepreneurs. And ultimately, you know, to be a citizen and to be a social entrepreneur, there's probably going to be no difference. We're all going to be very active in our communities. Any society, any group, company, city, ethnic group, religious group, country, whatever, the key factor is what proportion of your people are change makers? How do you facilitate them coming together? This is the ultimate culmination of the democratic revolution. No Palmeiras, tem um banner gigantesco que a gente coloca lá na sede que diz assim, Deus criou o mundo e nós construímos o Conjunto Palmeiras. Nossa maior honra é dizer esse bairro como nós construímos. O canto mais lindo do mundo, sabe qual é? Chama-se Conjunto Palmeiras. Que se eu achar que o mais lindo do mundo é Paris, é Nova York, é Torre, não sei de quê, tô lascado. É lá que eu vivo, é lá que eu me casei, é lá que tem meus filhos, é lá que eu choro, é lá que eu canto. Lá tem que ser o canto mais lindo do mundo. Lá tem que ser o canto mais lindo do mundo. Aconteceu no Palmeiras um fato muito comum de acontecer nas favelas que se urbanizam e a renda não aumenta que foi que os moradores começavam a vender seus barracos e ir embora para outras favelas. Por que isso acontecia? Porque eles não podiam mais pagar as contas. Agora chegava conta de água, conta de luz, conta de telefone. Olha o tamanho da contradição. Passamos 20 anos para construir um bairro e agora a gente não podia mais morar no bairro que a gente mesmo construiu. E aí nós dissemos, olha, se nós conseguimos criar esse bairro, nós vamos conseguir gerar trabalho, gerar renda aqui dentro desse bairro, com nossas próprias forças, com nossos próprios moradores. Nós inventamos, na época, uma brincadeira que era do balde furado. Qual é o dinheiro que entra aqui nesse bairro? Tem aposentado, que ganha dinheiro? Tem. Então, jogava uma bolinha para dentro do balde, chama dinheiro dos aposentados. Tem gente que trabalha? Tem gente que trabalha. Tem gente que ganha esmola? Tem. De repente, o balde ficava cheio de bolinha. Então, tinha muito dinheiro entrando. A verdade é que ali no Palmeiras, já tinha 1 milhão e 200 mil, isso em 10 anos atrás, que eram gastos mensalmente pelos moradores. Só que quando a gente perguntava onde isso era compra os produtos e qual é a marca, tudo isso era comprado de grandes marcas. Então nós dissemos o seguinte, nós vamos criar um programa que vai ser, a grosso modo falando, uma rolha para o balde. Cada rolha dessa do balde que eu consegui fechar, cada buraco desse, vai ser o dinheiro que fica aqui e gera renda. E aí não deu outra. Aí, em janeiro de 1998, nós criamos o que nós demos o nome em homenagem ao Palmeiras de Banco Palmas. Nós temos a moeda social, a moeda Palmas, que as famílias pegam essa moeda e compram no comércio do bairro. E um comerciante compra de outro comerciante. Assim, a moeda circula na própria comunidade, fazendo a riqueza ficar aqui no próprio conjunto Palmeiras. A lógica é a seguinte. O banco empresta para a produção e empresta para o consumo. Se eu conseguir equilibrar produção e consumo no mesmo local, no mesmo território, a gente gera trabalho e renda. Qual é a tese central? Qual é a certeza do banco comunitário? Não existe território pobre. Não existe bairro pobre. Não existe município pobre. Existem territórios, bairros e municípios que se empobrecem porque perdem suas poupanças locais. Qualquer território, qualquer bairro, qualquer localidade é portadora de desenvolvimento econômico. Joaquim Melo era um seminarista trabalhando pelos pobres e acabou virando banqueiro. Teve que enfrentar o Banco Central do Brasil para criar uma moeda própria e fundar o primeiro banco comunitário do país. Esse Banco Palmas que hoje está em 32 cantos do Brasil vai se multiplicar muito mais. Não surgiu em Harvard, não surgiu na USP, não surgiu na FGV, sem nenhum, nada contra todo esse povo, nada contra ninguém, mas surgiu numa favela nos grotões do Nordeste do Brasil. A pobreza não é uma sentença. A pobreza não é uma dádiva de Deus, não é uma coisa que não tem jeito. Basta que nós possamos aqui produzir, consumir, vender, comercializar um para os outros. Se eu faço as pessoas acreditarem nisso, eu consigo o que eu quero. Eu acho que a pobreza pode ser 
eliminated from the whole world because poverty doesn't belong to human society. Poverty is artificially imposed on human beings. Uh, it's not natural to them, it's not part of human being. So something artificial can always be peeled off. It's almost like a bonsai tree. You take the best seed of the tallest tree from the forest and you put it in a flower pot and let it grow. It doesn't grow as tall as the tree on the forest. No matter how long you live it there, it grows only very short, very small. It's an exact replica of the tree that you saw in the forest, but not as tall, it's just a tiny little one. And you wonder why it's so. There's nothing wrong with the seed. The only answer is you have not provided the base on which to grow on. The moment before we're born, right before we're about to come out on Earth, it is anyone's guess if you're going to be the son of a, of a rich, uh, rich, wealthy uh, family in uh, New York City or the third daughter of a peasant farmer in China. And it, it, that, that, that lottery, the ovarian lottery of life is just such an interesting um, thing that we, I think we all need to remember that so much of who we are and what we have is a function of just what we were born into. Recognizing that and respecting that and getting back in touch with that, I think it, it becomes so natural for us to actually think about others who um, were born into situations that were just, uh, that did not set them up to succeed as, as many of us um, have been able to do. Como será o mundo em que as pessoas acordam todo dia para buscar e viver experiências de alegria? E, consequentemente, essas experiências de alegria podem ser chamadas de trabalho. Like many people, you kind of think, gosh, I want to do something bigger and bigger, or just something, something to address this. A huge injustice, um, but you know, you get busy with your school and then your job. And you know, I think I was just kind of floating in life, to be honest. You know, I was making good money, I had great friends, life was good, but there was something missing. So in early 2005, and I met with Matt and Jessica, who are the co founders of Kiva. Kiva is an interesting story where the idea itself is so simple the idea is to use the internet to allow people to learn about each other and then lend to each other over the internet. And if you can buy a book on Amazon.com, then why can't you actually make a loan to someone uh, around the world who needs just a bit, you know, $25 or some small amount of capital um, to start a business to buy a sewing machine? So it's really just putting together the internet with microfinance. We don't want to show the poor as helpless people who need your help. We want to show the poor as people who have their own ideas of how they can actually um, get themselves out of poverty. And they want to be treated as a business partner with you. And they want you to be their investor, their lender, and they will pay you back. And it's a relationship based on mutual dignity. The heroes are the people on the website. Um, the, the celebrities are the people who are making loans and the people who are receiving the loans. Um, you can see their photos, you can see their stories, you can see why they're loaned, you can see their hopes and dreams and aspirations. In the first year, it took us, uh, it, we, we had not even raised one million dollars. Um, but now, every 10 days, we raise one million dollars. Good ideas, or what I'd like to call a correct idea in society, on the internet, will travel extremely fast. Um, and and that's, that's something that um, is just so wonderful to watch. It can actually just be all of us um, in really small incremental steps. Just the little things in our day add up and make this world spin in one direction versus another direction. This pursuit of meaning to make that your day job is one of the most beautiful situations you can put yourself in.
when people make career choices, if you have the opportunity to express love and respect in a big way, I mean, that's the greatest gift you can possibly have. If a child has all the toys and no love, that doesn't work. The same thing is true for adults. Cars, all this other stuff are indirect measures of success in life. And they're the shadows in the cave. A room full of toys just doesn't do it. Es la historia del, del pescador que estaba pescando con un empresario y, él, y pescaba simplemente para comer ese día. Y el empresario le decía al indígena pescador, ¿por qué no construís una red y sacás más pescado? Y el indígena le decía, ¿y para qué? Y él le decía, ¿y para que puedas comer? Y lo que te sobra, vender. Y el indígena decía, ¿y para qué? Y él le decía, para que puedas contratar gente que pueda pescar más con nuevas redes. Y él le decía, ¿y para qué? Y para producir más pescado. Y él le decía, ¿y para qué? Y para vender, ¿y para qué? Y para que puedas tener suficiente dinero. ¿Y qué voy a hacer con tanto dinero? Y nada, no te dedicas al trabajo y podés, por ejemplo, ir a pescar. We become acquisitive or materialistic because we've never been excited about our minds and about on all levels, whether it's intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, about a community, a community of minds working together, we've never been that excited about the mental realm. <laughs> You know, we would think a child was stunted if they didn't see any beauty in a mountain or a star, but we think it's totally natural if they don't see any beauty in the invisible laws and connections that underlie all of nature, in the sciences and mathematics. We think it's totally natural for the vast majority of people to, to, to graduate from school with no interest in those things. So we shut down part of everyone's uh, brains. Once you start using your mind and connecting with the, the world of ideas, uh, of images, and also with other minds, you realize there's an infinite source of a constant joy, engagement, entertainment that's free, absolutely free. Right from the beginning, when I saw the joy in the children, the, the joy at succeeding at solving puzzles, at using their minds, and the relief they had to find out that they were smart and could do something, that was the first indicator that there was something positive. There's some much harder ones down here. That's, that's about the hardest fraction stuff I can give you. I need your help with something else. Jump is a charity that's based on the idea that there's an enormous amount of potential in children, intellectual, emotional, that we aren't nurturing that mathematics can be a beautiful and engaging subject, that it can open up doors and whole worlds to them. Siddiqui, you learned so fast. How are you doing on this at school? I don't do math yet. You're not? How come? Because they never gave it to me. Why? You're brilliant at this stuff. So, do you mind if I bring you in some harder problems more? Yeah. I'm going to bring you in some word problems and things like that. Is that okay? Whoa. Please. Gosh. Thousand percent? Hundred percent. You got perfect. A plus. Give up, man. Oh, I don't want to hear that. The real root of material poverty, I believe, is intellectual poverty. Albert Einstein tinha em seu escritório um cartaz que dizia Nem tudo que conta pode ser contado. 
e nem tudo que pode ser contado, conta. No mundo dos negócios, pode-se medir o desempenho de uma empresa pelo seu lucro. Mas como medir o impacto de uma organização que ensina crianças a resolverem seus conflitos na escola? Ou de outra, que muda a vida de comunidades carentes por meio da tecnologia? Em 93, eu tive um sonho. E esse sonho redirecionou a minha vida. E nesse sonho, eu vi jovens de baixa renda usando a tecnologia para refletir e para impactar e para transformar a realidade em que essas pessoas viviam. Quando todos ainda pensavam que computador é coisa de gente rica, Rodrigo já falava em inclusão digital. Eu lembro em uma das nossas escolas no Rio de Janeiro, eu estava fazendo uma visita e conversando com um dos nossos educadores. E esse educador, emocionado com aquele momento, ele compartilhou a história da vida dele. Então ele começou dizendo que aos 12 anos de idade, ele se viciou em drogas. Chegou num determinado momento em que ele precisou é, trabalhar no tráfico para poder comprar as drogas. E dentro desse processo, ele foi preso duas vezes. E ele disse, eu lembro que ele disse para mim, Rodrigo, imagina tudo de pior que possa acontecer com um homem. Tudo isso aconteceu comigo nessas duas vezes que eu passei pela prisão. E num momento de confronto com a polícia, ele preferiu morrer do que ser preso novamente. E o policial deu cinco tiros na direção dele. E nenhum desses tiros atingiu esse rapaz. Esse rapaz, pela primeira vez em muitas semanas, voltou para a casa da mãe e passaram abraçados a noite inteira. Então ele tomou a decisão de sair da criminalidade, do tráfico, e procurou uma escola de informática e cidadania do CDI. E ele virou educador dessa escola e ele mudou completamente a vida dele. Então, exemplos como esses nos inspiram fortemente. O trabalho do CDI é muito mais do que ensinar tecnologia para as pessoas de baixa renda. O trabalho do CDI é sobre empoderar comunidades através da tecnologia. mid-80s, we began to hear the question of what would happen to children with disabilities when the parents died. Many countries will give people with disabilities their human rights. Rights uh, by themselves don't give you uh, an interesting life, don't give you a meaningful life. One of the biggest handicaps faced by people with disabilities is their isolation and loneliness and we realized that our core mission had to be the development of social supports or what we now call personal networks. And so we devote all of our time to creating a good life for people with disabilities and ensuring that they belong, that they are accompanied in life by friends, by people who love them and by people who care about them. When David's mother came to us, uh, it was just she and her son. She was quite elderly and she knew she was dying and so she was really concerned frankly, afraid of, was that David would become a homeless person. He was somebody with autism. He had no friends. He had no interest in anybody. And we built the personal network around David's two biggest passions. The first passion was that he loved classical music. Two out of the ten operas. Oh, that's new. One of your favorites. 
<laughs> and his second passion was that he hated dictators. He hated dictators so much that we introduced him to Amnesty International and they embraced him with open arms. About two years ago, network members took him to the doctor and he was diagnosed with an inoperable uh, brain uh, tumor. During the period uh, of him living in hospice, he had more visitors than anybody else had ever had. The walls were papered with telegrams, with posters. People would prepare videos, they would bring music in. The conductor of the Vancouver Symphony uh, came uh, to visit David. David, you have come to see me backstage after so many performances. You always valued what I did. You always understood what I did. He walked out of the room and he noticed a piano. And he sat down and he played uh, one of Mozart's uh, most well-known pieces and one of David's favorites. You haven't lived until you've been in a church at a memorial celebration for David where there's over 300 people. This potentially homeless man had inspired, had connected, was in relationship with people all over this city. I mean, we have met thousands and thousands and thousands of people with disabilities and every one of those persons wants to make a contribution to society. They want to be needed, they want to feel like they're a contributor, and I would say even further and more emphatically, every single one of them has a contribution to make. Os transformadores inovam porque têm um olhar fresco, livre de dogmas. Partem do princípio de que todos têm capacidades e conseguem liberar o potencial humano entre indivíduos que antes eram vistos como deficientes, incapazes ou irrecuperáveis. I was often really preoccupied with the issue of torture from a very, very young age. I would say even as far back as I can remember having nightmares when I was eight years old. And um, in my nightmares, I would be actually watching someone be tortured. And it was awful. It was awful because I'd be in the same room watching someone be tortured. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, I would wake up and I would wake up in a cold sweat. And it, at first I would feel relieved. I'd say, oh, it's, you know, it's just a bad dream. It's just a bad dream. It's, it's, it's not happening. But then I would be immediately disturbed because I realized that at that moment, exact moment, my nightmare was somebody else's reality. After I graduated from college, I went to work in some refugee camps. And what I realized at that age was that somehow being closer to the problem and putting whatever I could into being part of the solution and not part of the problem made my nightmares go away. When I reached Cambodia in 1994, I remember walking into prisons and I would see little kids in prison and women in prisons and I would say to the women, why are you here? And then women would say, you know, my husband committed a crime 10 years ago, but they couldn't find him and there she was. So we've been working on the Cambodian system and really seen some significant improvement. But we walk into a prison in Burundi, and what do we see? Ah, oh, same thing. I see the little boys, and you know, why are you here, 12 years old? Oh, I'm here for stealing a mobile phone. And beautiful babies. And so I remember, I saw like 20 babies, and I picked up one baby, and I said to a mother, your baby's beautiful. And, and the mother says, yeah, she is. And she says, and she's why I'm here. And the mother tells me that she had stolen two diapers and an iron to iron the diapers from her employer. She says, now, it's true that I stole the diapers. I was going to steal the diapers, but I was going to return the iron. And, and what I realized is she's been in prison for a year and a half. And I say to the prison director, she's been here a year and a half. You have to get her before a judge. He'll understand. He'll let her out. And he says to me, sure, okay. 
I'll get her before a judge. But then he turns to the rest of the prison and says, but look at this prison. Almost 80% of the people in prison are here pre-trial detention. They don't have a lawyer, and we don't know when their court date is. So it's probably, we'll get her in, because you said to. But how about giving us some help so we can work on the whole system? And that's what we really realize, and this is what International Bridges to Justice is all about. Really looking at going into a country and finding out how can we systematically create an institution and a structure so that there's systematic early access to counsel for every man, every woman, every child who is imprisoned. In another century, people said that it was impossible to end slavery. But a group of people said, we're going to end slavery. And it was the same thing for apartheid. People said, oh, you can't end apartheid. It's always been here. It's terrible. It's terrible. But you can't end it. But a group of people decided it's over. And it was over. And this is why I absolutely believe that we can end torture in the 21st century. A organização já reformulou o sistema de defensoria pública em vários países. E através do seu trabalho bem sucedido no Camboja, Karen Tse foi a primeira mulher autorizada a entrar na China para lidar com o tema da justiça. O objetivo de Karen Tse é acabar com a tortura e as prisões injustas ao redor do mundo. If we could read the secret diaries of our enemies, we would find inside them enough pain and sorrow to remove all hostility. And so that was kind of something that, that stuck in my mind. If everybody around the world were forced you know, to travel to your enemy country or a country where you just felt like you could never understand the person, um, you know, that would be a dream come true. But, You know, you can't force people to travel. It's against free will. So how do you, um, so how do you get people to travel showing films, to have people travel um, just through a movie screen and a projector? I don't know if movies can change the world, but the people that watch them can. So when you go into a movie theater in a dark room and you're taken out of your head and you're given an experience, you walk out and you, you often think very differently about the world if you've been really touched by somebody or their story. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create empathy through film. Because when you see somebody's story, when you laugh with them, cry with them, understand them, you have empathy towards them. And that opens up a whole new world of possibility in terms of solving world problems together. Roots of Empathy is a classroom program where we bring a two to four month old infant and the parent or parents into the classroom to visit throughout the school year. So it's an opportunity for students in a classroom to build their social and emotional understanding, to be able to um, care about others to learn about the experience of the other. And what happens in this program is that when their empathy, their ability to understand others goes up, all the bad things like bullying go down. In every classroom, there are children who are excluded. There are children who are bullied. There are children who have what they would call a sad headache or a sick pain in their tummy because their feelings aren't settled. There are many reasons children feel like that. And there is a big new tidal wave coming in education 
that is recognizing the research that says the best motor for learning is how you feel. There's two pieces to empathy. There's the perspective taking piece. And that's what they call the cognitive aspect of empathy and civility to imagine how another person feels. And if we can't do that, we cannot get to the first stage of conflict resolution. We cannot expect to have altruism in the world. But the other part of empathy is the ethic of care. It is core to our humanity. And that is where you need these loving relationships in order to engender that sense of wanting to care about others. There's a story about a young boy who was 14 years old. When he was four years old, his mother was murdered in front of his eyes. And he was in many, many foster care situations. But when he came to this class, he had already failed for two years. He was older than the other children, and he had shaved his head, and he had a ponytail at the top and a tattoo at the back of his head. He was trying to look menacing. And on the one visit where the mom was talking to the students about the baby being very independent, and she said, you know, when I put my baby in the snuggly, she won't cuddle in, she looks out at the world. So the bell went, and these kids were getting their backpacks on and was noisy, and the mom said, would anybody like to try on the snuggly? So um, our hero put up his hand, and he took the baby, and he put the baby in the snuggly, chest to chest, and that little baby molded into his body. And he went off into the corner and he started rocking. You know how moms do this seasick rock with the baby. And he put his arms around the baby in the snuggly. And it was just about a few minutes and he came back and he took the baby out ever so gently and gave the baby back to the mother. And he said to the Roots of Empathy instructor, do you think that if no one has ever loved you, that you could still be a good father? So I don't think we have the right to give up on any child, whether they're four or 14. For little children to decide to be caring or to be helpful in the world, they need to see examples of care and helping. It's almost as if empathy can't be taught, but it can be caught. It's viral. So the very future of our universe as we know it our capacity to get along with one another, to include everyone, to imagine a world where there is mutuality, shared concerns about a shared future. We really have to develop empathy. Young people, uh be looking forward to create a world of their choice. Uh, so first they have to decide what kind of world they want. And uh, they can sit down and write one, two, three features of the world they want to create. And must imagine what that kind of world would be, what will be the characteristics of that world. Once those are decided that you form your mind, this is what I want, then uh, you hang it up on your wall and work for it. That's as simple as that. It doesn't take much uh, you to turn a young person on. It doesn't take much to enable them to be who they truly are. Uh, at this age, they are poets, they are creators, they are innovators. This is the age when we must uh, get rid of the clutter and open up 
the possibility of them hearing about change making as a way for them to go. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. For what the world needs are more people who've come alive. And so I think if you can just find the thing that makes you come alive in this day and age, um, you know, no one's gonna stop you. And don't ask for permission from everybody. Just go do it. And, and people will start coming and, and they'll join you. And, and sooner or later you'll look back and you'll see you've strung together something that's really world changing. Um garoto de nove anos levantou fundos para levar água para uma vila africana. Dos mais jovens aos mais experientes, talvez a maior contribuição trazida pelos empreendedores sociais tenha sido a crença de que é possível, sim, acabar com os maiores problemas do mundo. This is your well. You read it. Ryan's Well, funded by Ryan H. For the community of Angolo Primary School. What is an everyone a change maker world going to be like? It's a completely different world than the world we've had. It's a world of true equality where everyone gets to contribute in a big way and where everyone has to be really empathetic, really ethical, really deeply respectful of the people around them to play. And it's, it's important for us to remember at all times that, you know, it's not just the destination. It's the journey. It's who you become in the process of the journey that matters at the end of the day. So one of my prayers and hopes for the world is this. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and wonder to this universe, to this community, and to each other. Thank you.